Thank you very much, and thanks for uh, still being here after Ben Rushworth. That was such a fantastic presentation. It felt like the end of a fantastic day, uh, and now you still have to sit through me. So I promise I'll be brief. It's very much in the tradition of TED that you come on stage and you talk about yourself. And I'm not going to do that today, and I hope by the time I finish, you'll understand why. First, I just want to play you something. Sounds kind of familiar and a little odd, doesn't it? So let's try again. We all know it. We've all heard it a million times. It just doesn't quite sound the way that we've heard it in the past. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows setting fire to the rain. And the reason you may not have recognized it at first is that all you were hearing were the strings. But it's kind of interesting because the strings are really where all the emotion in that song are. Strings are really what give it its heart. And I became very interested in trying to take this song apart and see how it got made and how the strings got to play the role that they play in that song. So the strings really start with a brilliant young woman named Rosie Danvers. And Rosie is a cellist. She started playing the cello at the age of four. She loved it. She went to Guildhall School of Music. She went through all her classical training. She graduated from Guildhall. She did quite a lot of session work. She didn't really like doing classical stuff. But she felt kind of adrift. She loved music, she loved her cello, but she felt she wasn't really being heard. And then she did what a lot of people have described in the course of today, which is, you know, she went to the pub and she had a couple of drinks with a friend and she thought, I know what I'll do. I'll create a quartet because then I'll have people I can play music with and we'll have something more we can contribute and maybe then we'll be heard. So a little while after she created her quartet, Rosie's sitting at home and the phone rings and it's from a music producer that she knows who says, well, I found this new singer and she has a song and we just thought it would be great if you could bring your quartet in and maybe do something to it. So it's two days from now, I'll send you the track. Can you just listen? You don't have to write anything, just listen and come in and let's see what we can figure out. So Rosie listens to this new young singer that she's never heard of, named Adele, on a piano track. And she thinks about this for a little while. And then she thinks, hang on a second, we're going to go in to a studio for a recording session with a string quartet, and there's no music? Are they mad? And so she works, and she thinks, and she listens, and she thinks some more, and she says to herself, you know, I don't want this to be OK. I want this to be, and I quote, perfect. So she writes her music and she goes into the recording studio. She meets Adele, she meets Jim Abbas, who is the producer for the song. And she said, it's something really interesting happened because it wasn't just that I took the guide track, it wasn't just that they took what I wrote. We played, we changed things, we moved things around. And in the end, at the end of the session, we had something that was perfect. And she said, I left feeling so pumped because somehow something had happened that day that wasn't just turning up and doing what you were told. And it wasn't just fighting for something and either winning or losing. It was about creating something together that we couldn't have done separately. 
So why am I telling you about all this? You know, am I just a big Adele fan? Well, not enormously. But I'm interested in Rosie's experience because mostly when we think about creativity, it looks a little bit like that, doesn't it? Or maybe like that. And of course, it's not all male and pale. So some of it looks a bit like this or maybe a little bit like that. But basically, we know all these people, and we know what they do, and we know their work, and we all think it's pretty great, and we think about their achievement, and we think about their success, and it's all about them, right? Wrong, really. Because what all of these people are truly is super collaborators. They're fantastically gifted, at finding other people to work with and finding ways to work together that allow them together to create something that they simply couldn't do alone. Now, super collaborators aren't new. Evolutionary scientists will argue that our ability to collaborate as humans is really what allowed us to have a fantastic evolutionary advantage that when we started out at the beginning of history as competitors, we got nowhere. It was when we learned to collaborate that we really started to make progress. Language, if you like, implicitly, is a collaboration when we all agree, roughly, on what words mean and how they work. Society is a collaboration, a social contract, where we agree to collaborate on creating communities, which means we sacrifice a little bit of freedom in exchange for a lot of protection and safety. A huge amount of getting here today requires road transport systems that have to collaborate. The internet is an astonishing act of collaboration between phone companies, hardware producers, software producers, browser designers, and website designers, and users. People at MozFest last week collaborated to create Popcorn Maker, which is a fantastic new piece of software that allows you to mash up video from all over the internet. We collaborate all the time. In fact, we do it so much, so often, and so naturally that it's incredibly easy to forget what happens when we don't and it starts to look like that. So what does great collaboration take? Well, first of all, it requires diversity, by which I don't mean that you have to do political correctness and have the right congregation of ages and ethnicities, but what I do mean is that you have to have very different kinds of people who think in very different kinds of ways. And the reason isn't to do with political correctness, it's because the more experiences and the more thinking styles and the more creativity styles you bring together, the more ideas you will surface. And we've seen, of course, in the banks what happens when you get too many people who all think the, right, the same way doing the same thing. So creativity requires a lot of diversity, which means it also creates a tremendous amount of conflict. And so a really great creativity requires the ability to do that conflict very well. It's an awful lot of what we've been hearing about in this afternoon session, which is the ability to listen to other people, to respect other people. So we need to be able to be comfortable with that conflict and comfortable with its ambiguity. And we need to be able to respect what other people bring to the table. I think one of the things that's most interesting about the, the career of Steve Jobs, when you look at it, Steve Jobs, always known as this fantastically heroic soloist, is in all of his great successes, he had a fant at least one fantastic collaborator. At Apple Computers, he had Steve Wozniak. At Pixar, he had John Lasseter. When he came back to Apple, he had Jonathan Ive. And when he ran a computer company all by himself, pretty much, with people who tried to second guess him and kowtow to him, the company named Next, it was a failure. It's incredibly important, this notion, that to create something truly great, we need a lot of very different people doing a lot of conflict 
very effectively and who are patient. Patient with the conflict and the uncertainty and the doubt that creativity always provokes. There's a fantastic story about um, governments coming together at the end of the Second World War trying to create the Marshall Plan, the plan that rebuilt Europe. And George Keenan, one of the diplomats who was in charge of trying to make this thing happen, talks about walking around the White House late at night in tears of frustration because he knows they need to do this. They know they need to do it quickly and they can't figure out the best way. And he said it was only by going round and round the houses, round and round the arguments, but being patient and determined to get the best that Europe was indeed rebuilt. So what that means for you, I think, is a couple of things which, which may not be completely consistent with what school and mass media are telling you. It means that real achievement and success isn't about winning. That if you go in to a collaborative or a creative situation determined to win, to be top dog, to be the big noise, you probably won't make anything because you won't build trust and you won't hear the amount of contributions and ideas that people have to offer you. And it also means that you need not to think about what do people want from me, not trying to second guess what's the good answer, what's the right answer. You do plenty of that in exams, but in real life, it's not about second guessing, it's about thinking, what is the very best contribution that I can bring? How do I make this perfect, not alone, but by listening to the people around me? I, <clears throat> I learned this absolutely the hard way. When I uh, was running software companies in the US, I had a fantastic bunch of people, fabulous coders, software developers, quality engineers, all kinds of people. We were building very cool software. And the company grew very, very fast, and it got really ugly, and it got really vicious, and it got really political, and I could not figure out what to do, because here I was, I was the chief executive. I was supposed to know what to do. And I went to breakfast with a friend of mine at some point, and I was pouring my heart out, and probably, if I'm being honest, I was probably whining quite a lot. And finally, she stopped me, and she said, you know, Margaret, I think in trying to hold it all together, you're holding everything up. I don't think the company would have survived if she hadn't told me that. And if I hadn't been desperate enough, probably, to accept her contribution. And now I do something that looks really solo. I write books and I write plays. And I recognize that that, even though I do a lot of it alone, sitting alone, it's a huge collaborative exercise involving all the people that I interview, all the books that I read, all the people that I meet at conferences like this, that it's a huge kind of mashup in my head. And frankly, it doesn't mean anything at all until people read it and apply it to their lives and tell me what it's meant to them. So even in this most solo of activity, I'm collaborating too. Just like Ben said, you know, the Paralympic Games aren't just about the athletes, it's the spectators that made them such a remarkable achievement. Rosie Danvers learned this a lot younger than I did. And I want you now, every time you hear her music, Adele's music, Set Fire to the Rain, I just want you to think for a second of all the people that went into making that song what it is today.
incredible, isn't it? Just incredible. I love all those people. So as you go out today with all these ideas buzzing in your head, I want you to ask a different question. Not how am I going to be successful, what am I going to do, but who can I collaborate with and what is my contribution going to be and how do I make sure that what I contribute is f perfect. Thank you.